I want to thank a lot Jean-François Toussaint to be here today. He's a professor of sociology, he's also a member of IPCC, working group two, right? Yep. And uh, he will talk about global health. I think it's a major issue in relation to, to the environment and to the ecological uh, uh, crisis we are uh, experiencing. So thank you very much to be here for the second year. We have students from the Pope Master, but also students from other master's courses that uh, that uh, are coming from Sorbonne University and from University of Paris and UTC. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Floor is yours. Thank you, David. Well, let's go inside the subject. We will have uh, a few ideas to uh, review this afternoon. Ten chapters, so maybe we can skip any time you want to intervene and uh, have interaction. I'm ready to do so. So what would be probably one of the last, but not least, but maybe the last event of uh, globalization of the 20th century? Any idea? Nope, she said. Maybe this one. Westminster Abbey, yesterday, 500 uh, people, head of state, dignitaries from everywhere, uh, and a certain representation of what was the British Empire, what he let, uh, and what he might be in the future. Why do I say that? Well, maybe because what we have to understand into uh, those elements of uh, global things, global health, that's going to be a, a subject of today, but also of the way of <coughs> understanding the different scales and levels where we have to ask the question, where we have to assess interactions, when we have to collect indices and parameters, um, might be something that uh, would be important to get inside the idea of risk. As many in terms of epidemiology always have to put uh, into the equilibrium that our lives try to provide to us inside a certain limit of the body, our body. Uh, also the question of the constraints, the external constraints, the internal constraints, and these equilibrium are related to risks. How can we measure that? Yes. No, it's not mine. No, it's out. It's some, somewhere there. This one? Okay, let's try to get that. The One Health concept was uh, at least 15 years old, uh, while it only uh, went into real uh, objectives by uh, WHO um, last year. Uh, with a uh, special expert panel and a group uh, from four the quadripartite, uh, the FAO, Food um, and um, Organization, the uh, OEA and the Veterinary, the uh, UN Environment and the uh, World Health Organization to try to get the idea of one global health, one health depending on many parameters from the environment, from the animal health too. A few working group were put into um, onto the table, implementation, knowledge, uh, monitoring, data sharing, but also the risk assessment from the fourth group. With a global perspective, a holistic one, with all the concepts that uh, get together with that. With the definition of getting inside those drivers, but also the tendencies and uh, the dynamics of the ecosystems and uh, animal diseases that would impact uh, human health. But the only problem is that the One Health is usually understood to try to preserve the health of one species. Is that the right question? Is that the right way? It's you think it's over? No, it's still there. Oops. It's not here. 
Um, and what they uh, try to say is to have the better monitor system to follow and track the emergence of disease in agents, uh, despite the fact of focusing too much on the human health, not trying to address koala survival, who cares? A few Australian among yours? Nope. Still? Question? But more and bro more broadly uh, related to that is the question of the health of uh, the ecosystems and the biodiversity that will allow for the human health and survival. So what is the risk? If there is one health, there is one risk, which is the one and well, maybe we can ask that question. This was not addressed in the last uh, AR6 uh, report from the uh, IPCC, though we opened the questions uh, at the early sessions uh, in 2020. And the question is about health crises as new ones or included inside uh, continuous processes. You might have a testimony from a previous um, head of those questions addressing the stress during the crisis, the declining support from donors, uh, the global funds uh, here with the problem of achieving the global goals, and the uh, question of ensuring the long-term sustainability. All this seems to be very factual, actual, present questions. This was addressed by Michel Kazachkin, who was the head of the Global Fund to find AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria just 10 years ago. A real present crisis or a continuous process? So if you want to understand the evolution, the dynamics of all this, you need to understand the context of that, the interrelation of the parameters and their interactions and prevent a few of what can be prevented, okay? So what, are, uh, what can be preventable is also a question where you can act, just do it. When you cannot, just accept as it is and make the difference between the two. For it is depending on non-linear non uh, interactions. It depends on the vulnerabilities of the populations that you are uh, studying. It depends on a few concepts of limits, both on the planetary side and on the human species side. And you have to ask those questions if you want to be capable of describing the global um, landscape. And to act, first, one which was in the A uh, AR5 report of the uh, IPCC, just don't use fossil resources. It was just evaluated uh, a few days ago. Um, we have still 3,000 uh, gigatons of CO2 just present inside those resources. If we do that, that's a plus eight Celsius degree, plus eight, without including the interaction by the uh, CO2. So we have to act on those until we just walk or bike, until we eat what we can produce by ourselves, we'll still be perhaps far away from the objective. But it's a question to uh, put on the table. We have to maintain reflection on the long-term, very long-term goals. Uh, include those questions in all the public health policies. We will see that uh, we had a recent example that just discarded all these elements in the major decisions that were taken, including by the WHO. And try to develop the co-benefit situation. As uh, inside the uh, WHO, uh, the question and the problem will be the functional stability. And the functional stability for the population that are asked is related to the health of the biospheric, biospheric systems essential to lives. 
The few of the elements inside the environmental problems are just listed here. The quality of soils, the water uh, resource, the energy is the major one to expand or not. Uh, the climate, obviously, is related to the previous one. But all these bring inside the question of the nutrition and the biodiversity. And climate change might just be one of the different threats of this century. So we need to assume uh, for that that we might be able to maintain the rate of progression that was known in the previous century. And the level of health protection. And the question is, do we have the real assessment that those can be maintained and how? Otherwise, and this was a very uh, crude um, estimation, this would have uh, 250 thousand additional deaths per year in the 30s, so just next days. Question is how do we measure that? What are the assessments? Is this by the thumb, under the wind? Is this properly uh, addressed? And in the uh, previous uh, millennium development goal that would turn out to be the now sustainable development goals, uh, those are addressed in the point 13, 14, and 15, the life under the water, the life on land, and the climate action. But at the same time that you have that, there is another one, which is on the economical development, economic growth, not development, growth, meaning can we grow forever? Although it's the same question. Isn't it a paradox that we have to solve? Do we solve that, or would it be solved by external constraints and external systems that will regulate? Just an example, the global biomass under the water and the biochemical cycling of marine fish under human fishing pressure just provide those numbers. Reduction by 20 to 80 percent, depending on the species, depending on the region, and depending on how many um, peak catch you can uh, now assess from the different places of the world. So there are huge impacts, obviously. And the question of getting those into the equation is also to understand what are the different scales of the successive wave that we will know. We have known the previous one with the COVID-19 as a health problem. We will have this winter and for the next decades, an economical problem related to the energy that we will have. Inside the climate question, resulting in a problem of biodiversity. We are inside those. Where are we? What are the scales of the different waves? What can we understand from that? And obviously, it's the same question as the previous one. Are we on the red list? Are we getting to the trap? of the uh, Union for the Conservation of Nature. Are we an element of the conservation? We will be preserved. That's really one of the questions. Inside those uh, regions of limits. A few ideas of getting that uh, came from observations that were done in the sport context. And uh, what was uh, seen and demonstrated is that the world records didn't grow much in the early 21st century. You had huge periods of development in the 20th century. You had the two elements of the World War I and II. Uh, but then, kind of a plateau in the last 30 years. If you look at the longevity and the maximal life duration, but also at the mean duration, what we call the life expectancy for both world, special uh, countries, or what would be the representant uh, of the previous world records, the guys and women who participated to the uh, Olympic Games in the uh, late 19th century up to the early 21st, 
and the uh, oldest ones, with Jeanne Calment up there, 122 years, you still see that there is something which is appearing now, kind of a densification, and just recently, 10 days ago, another world record, the oldest one, of the sovereigns. She had many records, but this one too. At the same time, you see that the economical expansion uh, might be also uh, reduced and uh, slowing its uh, rate of progression. And you can measure that, for example, in France, in the, uh, both the gross national product uh, in uh, blue here, but what is related to what we can invest from that growth inside the uh, health system, and which is the uh, consumption of care and medical devices. All of those for uh, more than five decades uh, went down, and we are now crossing the null line. And why I say that is just to mention, as uh, we said it, that all of those periods of development depending on what we used at the energy and 95% uh, of it, 90, uh, was fossil uh, resource and fossil energy. But this is the same thing. If you want to have growth inside a human system in the 18, 19, 20th and 21st century, this is related to energy and this is yeah. obviously related to fossil energy. So the question is how to maintain those as the phenotypic expansion both in physiology, in life duration, in economy, but also the height, the adult height of the population. 180 uh, countries here on the uh, yield, the production, or the energy per capita. All of those seem to provide the same type of relation with the two major moments of the World War I and II, and the plateau at the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century. So it seems that there is a process of optimization of growth and human development that is now here and measured by many of those in DC, the weight, the age at the first burst, um, maybe the knowledge, but we don't know how to measure knowledge. We don't even know how to measure intelligence, so power of knowledge. Tough subject. Limit, ceiling, whereas now the margin inside which we could uh, still adapt. This was a question that was uh, asked at the uh, Musée de l'Homme uh, this year by this exhibition on the Frontières de l'Humain, Human Frontiers. And you have that related directed and uh, related to what was the uh, impact of the uh, pandemic uh, two years ago. In the uh, first year, the COVID mortality was directly related to uh, the proportion of population of age population. So with the highest rate of um, uh, people in their 80s, 90s, and uh, 100 years, you had a direct relation with that. But more than that, and this line is showing that uh, some countries might have no progression at all of life expectancy, the rate of progression of this life expectancy, so the gain per year, which might be still by almost 10 to 11 months every year in some countries, in Africa, for example, and all of those developed countries here that are no longer progressing at that rate, just show again a direct relation with the COVID mortality. It means that you have vulnerable population when you have old countries, old societies, with the aging process is providing the vulnerable group inside your population where now a uh, virus can come. So at the same time you see that those sitting up here, there are some constraints, internal and external constraints, that are now uh, coming here with the question of what is the next period? Is that maintaining? Is that a reduction of the possibility? Uh, do we have action to prevent that? 
and maybe uh, securize of those. And just uh, two weeks ago, you have seen that uh, production of the, um, you know, uh, showing that the human development index had decreased for the two consecutive years. So it means that was here, and people said this is due to COVID only. And the second year, 21, still didn't have vaccination uh, uh, rate uh, and enough people vaccinated in the world. So they say, well, we should have been following that track. We didn't. But the question that uh, was asking um, uh, the head of uh, UNEP, where is he? Uh, Oops. Uh, is the new uncertainties saying we have no real guy to understand that. Don't we? Should we ask other question? This one related to the decrease of the life expectancy inside the US uh, and in other country. Do we have to reduce those impact? Or should we try to limit our own negative impacts? So how to work in degraded conditions that will come, how to act with caution near the hole? This is a question that we need, again, to address instead of doing the exact opposite. That's a way of understanding a few of these actions, especially the non-pharmacological intervention that were said to be uh, the better way of uh, struggling against uh, those aggression. But the problem is that uh, we seem to arrive at the limit of a long cycle of development. And from that, try to understand the different context of vulnerabilities. The first one, as I mentioned, is the aging of the population. If you see what is going through uh, the lifespan of people, the capacities are always getting up during the early two, three early decades, and then going down until the death. This is for the whole physiology. You always find the same type of um, lifespan expansion and regression of your capabilities. You see that also in the sport domain where uh, the uh, women world records, depending on age, not for each athlete, but depending on age, is just a very simple way of assessing this progression and the regression up until the uh, 100 years, when people still run at 100 years old, old of age. And uh, what you can see is that there is two of these curves that define the rate of progression and the second, which is the decrease in the regression. Those elements are uh, defining all the um, way and all the capacities inside uh, the human um, possibilities. But you can also define, depending on where you place that uh, level, uh, those vulnerability and uh, depending on your rate of filtration for the uh, glomerular function inside your kidney, depending on the uh, way that your heart is pumping your blood and showing that the uh, cardiac output is decreasing with age and increasing and decreasing more rapidly when you may have uh, ischemic cardiomyopathies or any of those cardiac diseases that will reduce the uh, optimization of functioning of the uh, organ. And under that, and you understand that there are two periods for that, the young age, and this is where we have the most uh, efficient actions for the uh, maternal and uh, infantile protection, uh, but also at the old ages, when you lose the autonomy, 
when you lose your independence. And that's the time where diseases and comorbidities are getting up. So the higher rate that you will have with age is just a pure function, an exponential function of time. Point. Nothing more complex than that. And you can understand also that from that relation between the capacities and age, you can also develop an understanding of what are the optima of uh, the capacities with a few other parameters. For example, if you take temperature, this is the uh, relation of age, but you have in the third plan uh, the interaction of temperature, for example, and you see that there is an optimum temperature for both capacities and survival, and this one is a little bit what we have known in the last days about, uh, not this week, a little bit before. It's okay? Okay. Good. Uh, it's around 23, 23 Celsius degree. When you're getting colder than that, you will see the mortality getting up. When you see, when you get hotter than that, then the mortality is getting much higher and much quicker. But it means that the... Uh, ways you can interfere at different age also vary. It's the same function, but your margin of adaptation are much more constrained. And uh, you still have those elements, but you can obviously adapt much more easily at 25 than when you come up down to your seven decades or more. And then, you can add many other together to understand how, depending on the sugar, depending on the BMI, depending on the temperature, on the uh, arterial pressure, on the rated energy, or vitamin D, whatsoever, you will have an uh, optimal relation, with usually, most of the time, just one peak, one point of optimization. It's not a complex curve. It's most of the time, a very uh, easy one. And then you understand that there are relations at the surface of this uh, front that is related to what is called Pareto front. Sometimes you get down during diseases. Sometimes you get uh, back up after the rehabilitation. And you must understand also that the energy that you use for that is not infinite. So when you have an optimization and a progression on one side, you lose on another. You cannot gain, you cannot earn, you cannot win on all tables at the same time. It's always compromise. It's always something that you have to deal with and if you gain on one point, you may not have the progression of another function. It's the repartition of this energy of this dependency that will uh, allow you to make the best you can. So what we understand now is how we have improved those elements, those relations between the external parameters and our capacities throughout the 18th century, the 20th century, and then having remember those vulnerability threshold at the bottom and under which are the population which are the most prone to the aggression of what I call the primary predators, viruses, parasites, bacteria. These are our enemies, the real one, not the discussion we can have here, because they interact at this level, okay, and reduce progressively what the population may suffer from in the next years. So how to understand those interdependencies? You also have to provide the uh, theoretical framework for those groups uh, inside IPCC, WHO or whoever, uh, where you can see that we are, as a species, in interaction with many others. What is the health of the system that allow our own? Or if we don't understand what are the networks of the relation 
inside the external and we address just one single by saying, well, we will target this one as a development of a prevention action or plan, do we understand that there will be many other consequences due to those networks of interaction inside the ecosystem? If we have the knowledge of that, we will understand a little bit better what would be the first term, the second term, the third term of interaction. And then uh, from that also understand that these vulnerabilities here will be uh, the relation and the consequences of the interaction of a potential that might be expanding but also that might be reduced in the next um, periods. So having those elements of context, uh, let's get into a few of these uh, elements that I won't uh, get too much deep inside. You have that, you have added that yesterday, right? So the summary of the IPCC report, one, two, and three has been done yesterday in uh, just uh, half an hour, right? I have all the knowledge of it. 3,000 pages. <laughs> Good. Just read them for tomorrow. <laughs> so this one is not a new element. The concentration is getting up for the CO2. We are getting up as much as where we were three million years ago. But most of that we had in 2020 an idea of what would have been the right <coughs> trajectory. So with the pandemic, uh, two years ago, we have had a reduction of uh, seven to eight percent of the CO2 emission, which was the right track. It was exactly what we wanted to have in the best element scenarios to be and inside the 1.5 Celsius degree uh, limit in uh, 2100, remember. Obviously, in 2021, we didn't follow the right track. So we went back to the energy economy function. And the pledges, it's very interesting. What we say, what governments say, what uh, people want to make is always getting in the right direction, always making more than the neighbor making more than the last year. And the current policy scenario uh, was there. We should have been here. And you see, that was the direction we have taken in 2020. So we have to stop everything for one, two, three, four, five months of lockdown. Stop the economy, stop the social interaction, stop the studio, stop the everything, and then we observe that this is the way we want to have it. Just a COVID-19, a COVID-20, a COVID-21, a COVID-22, a new COVID every year. Do we really want that? Question. It should be at least seven times higher than the pledges, the action, seven times higher to be just inside and to meet the uh, 1.5 goal. We are far away from it. And meanwhile, we can see that the heat waves are getting up. This is the southwest of Europe. And the number of heat waves that you have had with the duration and the intensity here. In 19, just two years ago, two years ago, remember before we had one of the highest, with five days at plus 11 on all this region. 2022, twice and there were even still a third, which was not taken in the publication, uh, period of heat wave at plus 10. Two weeks at plus 10. But the highest impact was from the uh, 203 with two weeks at plus nine. So this is why this is considered to be the highest impact heat wave. And you see the relation is here with a large number of uh, small period with high uh, values of temperature and very rare extended period. But the problem is that this 
line of interaction is progressing in that way. So we will have more and more of all. Small period, high impact, high temperature, long period. And this is what the IPCC uh, has put into it. And even more, we understand what are the problems, especially when the jet streams here, Europe, Eurasia, Asia, Asia uh, is no longer um, helped by what would be the uh, natural ventilator. The air conditioning is taken by the jet stream up there. And when this one is just getting down and dividing, the heat is coming up. And this was uh, seen at each heat wave in the last recent year. It was in the 76 and the 203 one. So we have a few uh, assessment of what are huge impact, not only on the Gulf streams, which are the question that are uh, questioning by the uh, uh, thermoyalin circulation inside oceans, but also on the air um, displacement of air masses. But we don't sense, we don't get that uh, understanding. When we have to see the, what the global warming is, we just see at Chamonix what is the uh, ice sea in the summer of uh, 1920. And this is what the ice sea really was just 100 years ago. Now, this has disappeared. This has vanished and this is the uh, amount of ice that has retreated progressively year after year. And the only moment when we get a real impact, obviously, is when extreme events come, either by unusual destruction, Cynthia 12 years ago in France, unusual power in uh, Erstadt Blessen, the Earth did appear here, just went through. That's 20 meters down, flushed away inside the Rhine. Or unusual location, the first in the uh, east coast uh, of Mozambique. But the probability of getting those uh, mega events is now getting up, and the major uh, societies and uh, the regions like uh, New York with the Sandy Storm 10 years ago started to get the point uh, of what would be this impact. Record draft uh, three years ago in Australia, millions of fishes, old species, uh, specific species from uh, Australia uh, went down with what is now called what a defonation uh, would be inside those elements. And I even don't speak of the mega fires that we can see. So again, do we have elements now to make all those together to understand what are the trajectories and what are the modifiable trajectories through the principle that we have. Here is uh, what uh, Will Stefan and his group has um, provided uh, just uh, four years ago in the major cycles of the climate in the uh, uh, previous uh, 100,000 years. This was shown to be this interaction of interglacial cycles, but it went up through the Anthropocene here and providing a much higher moment. And the question is, can we now get back to a, what he called the system stewardship with a stabilized Earth uh, at 1.5 and still remain in an unstable way, but uh, in a safe position or not? And getting through the planetary threshold getting what would the hothouse uh, Earth be. So in those papers, you have the uh, early definition and the early concepts of what are the uh, element in the game and what we have to address to understand it and maybe prevent it. Because one of the major points, and you have seen that uh, goal of one of the group of the next uh, IPCC is these famous tipping points. A tipping point is something like this here. In the trajectory, you don't follow 
slowly you just boom, fall down. And you fall down in a situation of stability, complex system stability, uh, which is not our own. It's not our stability, obviously. But with those um, elements, you see that uh, there might be in the next uh, years and decades a lot of those domino effects that would put us in those situations with uh, these kind of tipping points, especially if we are in an unsustainable situation with uh, climate, with the uh, biochemical fluxes, uh, with the uh, question of the... Um, uh, but also in the human uh, situation, when we have, with undernutrition, with heat, with uh, food, vector-borne, waterborne, airborne uh, infections, uh, a lot of those uh, impacts that would help us to adapt or not. And the funny thing is that uh, just 50 years ago, uh, the Meadows report just provided a lot of those indicators, elements, and combination of interaction that were showing that uh, in both industrial production, in um, nutrition production, in terms of demography, in terms of uh, pollution impacts, or uh, in the de decreasing resources, uh, there were elements to put those um, into the discussion. And this was almost just discussed in the, uh, a few circles, but never implemented, never at the level. You have seen that the uh, one else is coming from the uh, actions of the veterinary and an American uh, society, uh, the uh, veterinary uh, health with the uh, impact and the beginning of the process at the international level 15 years later. So 50, 50 years later now, with that in uh, the uh, discussion, there are still no way to see what the uh, confrontation with the fact due to those simulations uh, were putting proper hypotheses was uh, the characteristic of what was, again, the dependency on the fossil uh, resources and the uh, greenhouse gases emission. So what would be the predictability in the future? Here you have an excellent paper on the last 50 million years. And you see that we have been up to uh, 900,000 ppm of CO2 in there just in the early Eocene, 51 million years ago. We are now crossing the line of uh, 415, and we might be in one of those scenarios back in just uh, at the end of this century, back to almost the same level. So again, the question that Will Stefan was asking is really a question at this pace, at this rhythm, at this rate of progression uh, that uh, could be one of the answer of why is this now getting that quick? Question you have heard in the last uh, weeks. Uh, we have seen that in Europe, we have seen in India, in Pakistan, uh, in the spring, we have seen in California, everywhere. It is accelerating and the question is what would be back to the Winsmister Abbey. Uh, a possible funeral at the end of the century by plus four, no way. There is no access anymore. By boat at the second floor, maybe, but still. Intricated risks. Direct effects, I mentioned those. Temperature and mortality, you have uh, Optimal point here, around 23. When you get down, you have an increase of mortality. When you get up with higher temperature, mortality rate is accelerating at a much higher pace. In fact, uh, this is the same everywhere in the world, and you have even an impact on the birth weight uh, after um, pregnancy. But the relation is very symmetrical. The only way we had 
asymmetrical uh, relation here is because we have the technology to fight against cold. It's just eating. And again, eating is fossil energy. So far, maybe in the next decades, might change. But there are problems for that. Here we have solved the problem of that uh, part of the curve. Here, we haven't. We don't know. We don't know except by putting uh, air conditioning, meaning increasing the uh, rate of uh, CO2 emission. So the question in the uh, optimal point around 23 just is asking the question of uh, capacity and, and survival in the next uh, way. As the relation is here, and you always, throughout the year, um, balancing between the winter, the summer. And this optimum is in uh, May and in early September. The optimum is around 23. This was in uh, 203. And in 203, the mortality cycle, which you have seen here, with a high rate in winter at the beginning of each year, okay, is not depending on the uh, flu. It's just depending on the cold. But you see also that there was already in the uh, late 90s and uh, early 90s, a small peak in the summer already, up to 203. And this was the first year where the mortality rate in the summer was higher than the two peaks in the previous and the next winter. So this was the real alert when we say, OK, th this is crossing the line again. OK, went back. And then we track those peaks every year. There was one this year. They said it's COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Maybe not. Maybe just those heat waves, successive heat waves in France, like in many other Western countries in Europe, um, were related just to those dependency. Livestock, animals are following the same, obviously the same way as human. So there is a peak of mortality um, in beef, cows, uh, rabbits in the north of France in 19, for example. But the yields of cereals also uh, had the same impact, 15%. And you have per each degree, 5% reduction of cereals yields for the most important uh, yields. Uh, wheat, rice, maize, soy, all of those a little bit less or more, but uh, showing the same uh, impact. Obviously, the food disruptions are the one that will uh, put uh, high pressure on governments and states. I will just skip on that. Um, to mention that um, with the indirect health effects, you have ways, again, to put not only the theoretical way of understanding those impact of the heat waves, of the extreme events as we have seen <coughs> their pollutions, on the morbid mortality, on the undernutrition, the stress in general, but also the uh, indirect impact throughout the biological processes, the yield, the water quality, the vectors, or through the social uh, impact that you can get from these. Uh, and the element of uh, maintaining the uh, level of development or uh, the regression that we might um, see uh, will obviously directly impact those principal factors. Wheat went up. Oil, sevenfold. Electricity, tenfold. Gas, twentyfold. Just in the last month. It's not related to climate. It's just intricated processes that show that there will be multiple aggression. OK, remember the uh, uh, scheme? And we don't have fossil nor fissile resources. And we don't have the space in Europe 
to develop the uh, renewable energy at the rate we need that. Okay? When you see uh, the, uh, how we say in uh, English, is eolien? See? Okay? Uh, the number that would be needed to match uh, our energy uh, demand is not just simply not uh, the rate where we can develop it at that level. So it means that the situation is fragile. And in fact, again, by the same group, uh, Stefan, Kemp, and a few other, uh, this paper showed and again put the vocabulary, the le, uh, lexic, and the uh, uh, indicator in theory on the state fragility showing that might be extreme heat, potential biological catastrophic hazard, nuclear, uh, would be always concentrating on a few places uh, here and there. Extreme heat, the intertropical, obviously, all the North uh, Africa, but also Pakistan, uh, India, uh, Indonesia, um, one billion, two billion, three billion people connected to that. The same time, Princeton uh, showed that uh, simulation, looking at the nice fireworks that would be uh, uh, put up, lighted up uh, by a nuclear war, with the uh, heads coming from uh, both sides of the Atlantic. So those, in a few hours, those consequences are again simulatable. So you might put that in the few equation and getting uh, on that question of uh, survival uh, the way that some mechanism would result in increase or reduction of mortality and morbidity and the question again of vulnerability but also to the domino effect that I was mentioning uh, earlier. And for example in the future population distribution the demography is never addressed demography problem is it never Ehrlich published that uh, Ehrlich uh, in uh, 1969 population bomb okay it was a publication bomb no way to address that question can we really put that into a political agenda can we address that question and say well now we have to deal with that maybe we could if we don't something else will do that for us the question of the population distribution and extreme heat here are telling you again that uh, FAUS under sub-Saharan uh, countries, the east uh, parts, uh, Pakistan and India, Indonesia again, are the places where um, most of those combined risks uh, will be. And during that moment, there is no way that we can address despite the uh, pledges, uh, money enough to put the financial compensation that were uh, asked at that moment by all the countries that would suffer from uh, the climate change and the uh, rising levels of seas, for example. Why this and why do we have such an inertia? Again, uh, this is the... Um, uh, last uh, report, uh, Navigating in Certain Time at the UNEP, uh, showing that uh, inside our uh, way of thinking and the way of producing our words, communication, language, looking in both uh, English, Spanish, or German literature uh, throughout the 20th century, except after World War II, in the German literature, uh, where there was a huge peak of of uh, interrogation and words and sequences of words reflecting depression and anxiety there has never been that surge that we can see at the late 20th centuries and early 21st mm -hmm. about uh, what would be our future so the question is also why don't we act as we know and uh, what uh, Akim Steiner uh, say that the real paradox of the time would be this inability to act while we have the understanding, 
we have all the indicator. Science is bringing everything and a huge amount of scientific uh, knowledge is put into those IPCC, these platform for biodiversities and everything. We have the knowledge, we understand, but it is above us. So remain the anxiety. And the second paradox really is a question which is not only philosophical, but uh, which is the question of what is science used for? If this is just to show and demonstrate that this is ineluctable, uh, there is no way to escape, should we still work in science? It's a question for the uh, EPOC program. <laughs> but obviously, this, these questions are not asked, and though you can come inside the APC and saying, well, we need to get the process to the end and see if we can reverse it from the end, there is no way, there is no political agenda to ask those questions and then put the parameters, put the problem, and try to make an understanding and a possible action onto preventable uh, measures that would help to limit those. So just have a close follow-up. Understand the risk for both biodiversity, for water sharing under strong constraint. You have seen that this summer. Agriculture, drinking, leisure, nuclear plant pooling. I should be dealt with. The uh, urbanized uh, societies are questioning the question of transport inside the cities. So what would be the resistance of the supplying systems? We have seen that during the COVID, the frontline professions. But also the uh, implementation of all these lines of supply when we will uh, leave an energy, an energy crisis. So the five major factors, as I mentioned earlier, that were uh, related to the uh, observation that Jared Diamond did on the collapse of past civilization was on demography, never address, politically impossible, climate, we have it, water, agriculture, depending on energy. And the fifth one is also related to the technology that we have developed with the energy we had and the knowledge we had in the last 200 uh, years. So the future is the race. The race again between the uh, adaptive capacity, which are stimulated by technology. Obviously, the vaccination and the vaccine that was discovered and useful uh, were discovered in a time that was not uh, imaginable uh, just uh, five years ago. But we have uh, side effects of all the technologies. And why we are doing that, there are still constraints from the environment that are coming from the negative effects from these technologies, CO2 being the first. So to conclude, what would be in the seeing the possibility of uh, acting? First, understand, accept, act when possible, be creative, reinterpret and respect all the uh, kind of interpretation. Understand also the denial. The denial are everywhere, including inside science. People have the schemes of thinking that they acquired in their early time of uh, education. Most of the time, they change very slowly. You bring the change, but you will be also in a possibility of staying with your comfort of understanding. Be adaptable, be creative, use whatever you will have to uh, know and what you will get from outside to increase your way of um, dealing with uh, uh, everyday life. And certainly uh, the belief that interpretation will be tremendous, the errors even worse. So the slippery slope is one of the question. There is only one way to optimize what is doable for you the local environment, and then make it progressively uh, larger. You just mentioned uh, Quentin de la Roche-Lambert, Nicolas Forsman, Julian Antero, Andy Marc, 
Guillaume Solière et Adrien Sedo uh, as providing a lot of those way of uh, understanding those evolution. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>